I'm going to bring to you a message this morning that I feel is very important. As a matter of fact, I believe it's going to be one of the most important messages that I could ever bring to you. And I'll explain to you why as we go forward. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you, if you will, to turn with me to the second book of Timothy, chapter 1. And this is our custom and his honor of reading the Word of God. I'm going to ask you, if you will, to stand to your feet in reverence and respect to acknowledge the Lord Most High, that we honor Him and His Word. I'm going to read a portion of these scriptures to you and preferably lay a foundation for this morning's message. And I, I believe that if we are honest with ourselves today, every person that's in this room today will be able to relate to this message that I bring to you this morning. The book of 2 Timothy, chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience. As my forefathers did, as without ceasing, I remember you in my prayer night and day. Greatly desire to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. <coughs> when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I persuaded, I am persuaded as in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. I want to focus on verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. 
but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed for I know whom I, have, whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Verse 13. Hold fast the path of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Let's stop right there. Father, we honor you as our God. We give you glory and we give you praise. And right now, Father, as is my custom, I yield all that I am to you. And I desperately acknowledge that I cannot do anything that you've called me to do apart from your spirit and your anointing. I pray, Father, that you would clear my mind of any distraction, anything that is not of God, that you will interject into my thoughts words that I have not yet pondered for the benefit of those who are assembled in this room today, that Jesus would be glorified and magnified, that you in turn, Father, would receive all the glory. We honor you as our God. We give you glory and praise now as we pray together. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And amen. And amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. As I read to you these verses from the book of 2 Timothy, I couldn't help but focus on two particular verses. There's so much more here, but for the sake of this message, I want to focus on these two verses from 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 7, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Paul writes these words to his spiritual son, Timothy, to encourage him in the middle of his situations, in the middle of his circumstances, to remind him that he has a purpose, that he has a calling, and that all that he goes through has purpose. And combined with verse 13, notice what it says in verse 13, hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. He he says that God has not given us the spirit of fear. And I want to invoke that right now in in your mindset, in your thought processes. For I'm here to remind all of us today that we have an adversary on this side of heaven who desires to take anything that God pours into your spirit, into your thoughts, into your mind, and discredit the truth of that matter. You have an enemy today that is apt to thwart the plan of God in your life. And more often than not, we we simply do not recall or remember or even take into account that that is the case. But, But the Word of God tells us, He gives that God gives us power. I want you to understand that God gives us strength that God gives us a mighty work, that God does this in our lives, and he gives us love. 
But I want to focus on that third element where it says that God does not give us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I want to focus on that for the remainder of this morning's message. Because what I've come to understand is that many of us today find ourselves in areas of spiritual warfare. How, how many of you today would acknowledge that somewhere in your life, even right now, you are experiencing something in your life that you would deem as a battle in your life? Look at all the hands. You see, this is common. It's just, it's just not me. And it's just not you. But more than likely, it's many of us, if not all of us, are experiencing something right now that is combating or coming against what God is endeavoring to do in our lives. But Paul reminds Timothy that God gives you a sound mind. But I want you to understand, you see, recently I, I, I've heard this premise or this notion that, that simply by, by, by being who we are in Christ, we can claim all of these scriptures as true. And the reality is, yes, we can. But I've also come to the, uh, to the realization that more often than not, there is a cooperative effort between the promises of God and what we do. And it's in correlation with what we do with the promises of God that make the word of God true and it, uh, allow it to manifest itself in our lives. So I want to share that with you as we go forward. You see, this word, this word that God gives us a sound mind this word, and listen to what it means, because I'm, I'm fascinated when I come to this place where I can define what these words truly mean in their original vernacular or language, and not specifically what you and I have learned according to our own language. How many know that oftentimes words that are defined in Greek language or Aramaic or even Hebrew oftentimes have a different meaning than what we've come to know those words to be defined as? So I want to give you some clarity in terms of this, what this means. Because notice what it says, that, that it not, he gives us a sound mind. And, and when you really understand this, in, this, this, this area of Scripture, you'll understand that this word sound, one of the definitions is, is he gives us discipline or, cur to, or a correct mind. That God has the capacity to give us a disciplined mind. How many of you would say that every now and then, even in your own spirituality, you would lack a little discipline? Is there anyone that would acknowledge that truth? That, we, we, that we, we don't have the discipline that we should have in order to experience the very best of what God has for us. And I want to share that with you today. Because as I said to you, this message might be the most important message that you can hear where you are right now. Because all of the promises of God must wake, make their way through an area of your life and mine, and that is your mind. When you hear the promises of God, you must allow them to register in your thought processes, and then you determine what you believe. So if your mind is not sound, if it's not disciplined, if it's not correct, the potential of missing the promises of God or what God has for you is available to you and to me. All over the Word of God, I want you to see what this really means to us. You see, over the past number of weeks, I've come to the realization that there is a battle. This world is out to capture your mind. We all know that. I want you to understand that not only is this world out to captivate you or to capture your mind, the enemy is after your mind. You see, you've heard me say in the past that God is after our hearts. He wants our heart. Why? Because it is the heart that is defined as, as having the meaning of, that it contains or, or inside the heart of who you are is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Or we can say your mind, your emotions, and your will. That's where it starts. So, so, so God is after every area of our mind, but the enemy is after your thought processes. Because he knows that once he can control your thought processes, he can control you. 
So he's after your mind. So situations occur in our lives that have the capacity or the tendency to take us away from the promises of God, and we begin to look at those situations in our lives. How many of you have been there before? How, how many of you have ever been on the top of the mountain in God? And then something happens in your life, and you find yourselves down in the valley. You know what I'm talking about. You've been there before. So I want to show you today. For those of you that, are, that today are endeavoring or desiring to get to that next place or that place where you can experience what God truly has for you, I'm going to show you what the Word of God declares to you today. Because there are times that I can look at you and I can see the crowd. And I know that there's something that's going on in your life. Maybe, maybe you're not so aware, but I believe that every now and then God gives us a symbol of discernment. And some of you, I can even discern today that you're experiencing something in your life right now that you need a response to, that you need an answer to. Can I get a witness? Anyone here today? In the book of John, chapter 10, I'm going to show you something in the book of John. A very familiar verse we often hear, John 10.10. 10. Most of us, I can say that verse, and most of us can quote that verse simply by heart or memory. John 10.10, 10. listen to what it says. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now, we know that oftentimes this is a reference to the enemy, the adversary. And if we use that even my, even if I stop right there in that verse, I can convince you and I can convey to you that the enemy is out to steal your joy. He's out to kill your faith and he's out to destroy your destiny in God. That's what he wants to do. Every one of you here, every one of us today has purpose on this side of heaven that God desires for us. And the enemy is out to try to take all of that away from you. But Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You know that verse. Now, now, now I want you to understand because, because oftentimes we overlook this and, and we, we might even register it in our minds like this. I have come that they have life and that they have it more abundantly. So, so we, we, we discount the area where Jesus himself says that they may have. That they may have it more abundantly. When you see that and focus on that, it conveys to me the idea that it is, it is not a guarantee that you and I will ever have life and that we will have it more abundantly. He says that they may have. That they may have. So, so as I read this, I noticed the prelude to those that may have life, that may have it more abundantly. It's found in the previous verse. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And he will go out and find pasture. In other words, the inference is that those that might have life, that might have it more abundantly, are those who have entered into relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the precondition. So, so once again, when I, when I read those words, may have, may have, it reminds me or reveals to me that the antithesis of that could also be stated, they might not have. They might not have it more abundantly. I found another verse in, in John 16, verse 32. Indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, has yet has now come that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Jesus speaking these words to his disciples. And he says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me, notice what he says, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Those are shouting words to someone that Jesus has overcome the world. But notice what he says. Notice, you, you, you must notice this. He says, notice, he says that you may have peace. 
These things I have spoken to you that you may have peace. But then he goes on to say, however, you will have tribulation. You may have peace in me, says the Lord, but I tell you, says the Lord, you will definitely have tribulation. How many can relate to that? What am I trying to say to you? You may have life. You may have it more abundantly. You may have peace. But remember, Jesus says, Jesus says in Matthew 7, 14, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Jesus himself says that there are few who find what he has come to provide for those who is, he has come to provide it more abundantly. Jesus says there are few who find it. Not everyone will experience what Jesus says you may have. So, so this morning, what I want to do is cause you to be introspective, to look inside of you. Not anyone else, but you. Because remember, the enemy is after your mind. So we see, according to the Word of God, why this is so important. Why is it so important that we have a sound mind? Over the past number of weeks, I've noticed how this has all come to the forefront of the generation in which we live. It's as though the Holy Spirit himself knows what he wants me to do and conveys to me these thoughts and these areas in my mind that I began to develop and know that he is leading me. Began to see a number of messages that were, that were uh, being rendered about the mind. A few weeks ago, I was watching, I was watching uh, uh, something on, on a, a video, or, or I can't recall what, I, what it was. I believe it was a basketball game. I'll just be honest with you. Because most of you know that I'm a huge, you know who a fan I am. Even when they lose by 20-some points. But in the middle of every break in this particular game, there was a commercial that was about the mind. Every commercial was about the thoughts. And I realized even then that the world is out to give you a response or an answer to those issues or problems that you might be having in your mind. But what I've also come to the realization is, is what the world has to offer is often contrary to what the Word of God declares. And I don't know about you, I don't know if there's anyone here today that has come to the realization that having Jesus and all that He has or can be in your life is greater than anything that the world can ever bring into your existence. It's Jesus. And no matter what the world tells you that you need, no matter what the world tells you that you're lacking, I'm here to tell you what you might just need is more of Jesus in your life. And I want to share with you why this is so. In the book of Isaiah, listen to this. Another very familiar verse. Isaiah 26, verse 1. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah, the Lord, is everlasting strength. That's the book of Isaiah. And we know here that, that, that God wrote these books through the prophets to his covenant people. But you and I can yet take hold 
of these promises by virtue of who we are in Christ. But, but notice what it says. You will keep him in perfect peace. But here's the condition. Whose mind is stayed on you. Did you see that? You see, uh, let, me, let me digress just a little bit. Let me see if I'm speaking to the right crowd today. Is there anyone here this morning that will acknowledge that sometimes in your life, in the thought process that go through your mind, once again, the battles rage. Anyone here ever deal with the area of, of, of worry? Any, anyone ever here deal with the area of doubt? Anyone here ever have a little bit of an anxiety in your life? Let me get here. Anyone here ever even reach that point of feeling as though you are in depression? Look at all the hands. Even in the household of faith. So if Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, then he must be the answer to all of those issues that we just lifted our hands about. Amen. Understand, understand what this word means. This is what, why is this, is this so important? Because when you understand, once again, the meaning of these words, look at the promises. He says, you will keep him. This word to us, to us, is keep sounds great in our language, but it sounds even better in its original context. Because in its original context, this word means to guard. So imagine that now you will Guard him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. How many would say that guarding is a little bit better than keeping when it is rendered from someone else in your life? Oh, yes. But here's what I want you to understand because it goes on to say, whose mind is stayed on you. This word mind is defined a form Figuratively, figuratively as conception. I want you to get that. It goes on to be defined as imagination, as, as mind, as work. But do you understand, even in this verse, in Isaiah 26, it shows you how important it is to keep his, that he will keep his mind in perfect peace, whose mind is standing. Why? Because it is in the mind where thoughts are conceived. That's where it starts. Conception is the beginning, the genesis. So, so if you don't control the beginning or, or are able to deal with the conception, then to define goes on to say imagination. Then your imagination will take control. I, I wonder how many of us have imagined something of drastic measures would occur in our lives just by virtue of that thought being conceived in your mind. How many of you have ever had something occur? It brings a thought into your mind, and before you know it, your mind takes you all over the place beyond your control. Have you ever been there before? It starts in the conception of your mind. Now, here's the thing. It's conceived in that initial thought. The imagination takes it to where you allow it to go. And then the last definition of this word is work. In other, in other words, it is conceived. Your imagination takes it wherever. And then your work determines how you respond to those imaginations that have gone through your thought processes. So that's why it's so important. Because what you believe or what you think, your imagination takes control. And then oftentimes it determines what you do in that situation. How, how many would acknowledge to me that there has been a time in your life because of what you imagined might happen under a certain situation, you responded in a way that now in retrospect, you know and acknowledge that you were wrong. Anyone ever been there before? Because that's what our mind will do. And I want you to understand that, that all over the word of God, I, I want to give you some hope this morning. Because, because once again, I ask you the question, how many of you have experienced any of this and those of you who were forthright and honest and maybe not ashamed to let anyone know that you have these types of situations in your life? Raise your hand. 
Most of you did. Most of you are raising your hand right now. I'm here to share with you, according to the word of God, the promises of God for you and for me. Why, Pastor David, is it so important that you bring this message? Because if your mind is not sound on this side of heaven, you will never fully understand or comprehend or grasp a hold of what God has intended for you. And I'm not here to just give you a sugar-coated message and just simply say, well, you're a child of God. You've overcome. You're, you've been bought by a price. Your sins are forgiven. You're on your way to heaven. Everything is right with you. So I'm not going to go there. Because I know that once you leave this place and you go out those doors, you go into your real world with real problems and real issues that you have to contend with. And the question is, what do you do in those situations? Here's the good news, people of God. Because there's a way that the enemy tends to kind of bring condemnation into our lives by giving us the inclination, the mere fact that we have any of these things going on in our mind that we're not good enough for the kingdom of God or that we're falling short in the kingdom of God or we don't qualify for the promises of God. I'm here to tell you right now, in spite of those things in your mind, you are yet good enough. You are yet qualified. God has seen you. God knows your situation. God knows your problems. He knows your issues. And yet he yet loves you and is calling you into his presence. So what the enemy comes to destroy, remember, God is endeavoring to give you a semblance of faith and trust. Because I want you to understand, notice what he, let me go back to that verse, because I want you to understand that the, the, here, here, here's the condition. Here's the condition. All the promises of God oftentimes will have conditions of what we have to do. Do you want peace? Do you, does anyone here want life more abundantly? Then the conditions is what is we, what is it that we have to do? Notice what he says. Isaiah 26, once again, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. You know what we do? Situations happen, circumstances occur. And all we do is keep our minds and our thought presses on what has just happened. And we lose sight of the promises of God. That's what we do. But, but you understand, as you continue in that verse, he, say, he says, he says that person will be in perfect peace. He was mighty on you. Why? Because he trusts in you. No, no, notice, because he trusts in you. It was on to say, trust in the Lord forever. Why? For in Yah, the Lord is everlasting strength. Someone in this place knows in the middle of your greatest trial that you trusted in him and you believed that him was everlasting strength. But he says, trust. Because he trusts. Because he trusts. Because he trusts in the middle of all the problems, he yet trusts. Because even though this situation has happened in her life, in his life, they yet trust in God. It's the trust. I love what Cheryl said, trust. We trust him. He entrusts us. But listen, people of God, if we cannot get to this place, then no matter what happens in our life, no matter what contradicts what we perceive as the best situation, if we can never accept the fact that we yet must trust in him, we'll never fully understand why he allows us to go through things that we go through. Because it's in the middle of those moments in time. You see, it's easy to trust God when everything's going your way. It's easy to trust his promises when everything seems to be exactly the way you want it to be. But how many would agree with me that when situations come, when the winds of adversity blow your way, when circumstances occur in such a way that you were not expecting, then your trust is challenged. So you see it here in the Word of God. What I want you to understand this morning is that all over the Word of God, there are those who are experiencing exactly what I'm referring to. You see, most of us today, however, are not governed by the promises of God. Our lives are governed by our thoughts. Our thoughts will in turn then determine 
or control our emotions. Our emotions then lead to the point of making a decision that impact us personally. And oftentimes will impact others based upon the decisions that we make. So most of us or, or, or today, even, listen, even in the body of Christ, are more governed by our emotions, how we feel, whether or not I'm upset, whether or not something has happened, as opposed to the will and promises of God. Emotions. Happiness. Just a basic list of emotions, happiness, worry, doubt, fear, sadness, anger, pity, self-pity. As I read those, once again, how many of us can relate to any of those words? Happiness, worry, doubt, fear, sadness, anger, pity, self-pity. How many of us can relate to those emotions? Most of us. But I want you to understand that, that through this, I want you to see that you're not alone. For the next few minutes, I'm going to share with you just real briefly, convey to you the idea that all over the world of Word of God, there are those individuals who experience exactly what you and I go through on this side of heaven. It is, isn't it a, a bit of a consolation when you realize that, that even the great men and women of, of God in the Word of God have gone through similar situations as you? How many find that encouraging? That I, that's, at least it's just on me. I'm glad when you tell me that, that, that when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden and God came looking for Adam and Adam said to him, and God said to Adam, where are you? And, and Adam says, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. The very first man that was created experienced fear. Why? Because he got out of the will of God and disobeyed what God said to, for him to do. So there was fear. Why are we controlled by these negative emotions in our life? Oftentimes, there's a reason why. Not just Adam. Number, number of men. I'm just going to give you a few just real briefly. Saul. Remember Saul? Saul. Saul was first appointed to be the king of Israel. We know that as you study his life, that he was disobedient to the things of God, that he became proud and self-exalted. And, and when Saul sinned, he blamed others. And ultimately, all these things occurred in his life. He, he was jealous of David. He grew angry and enraged in, because of his jealousy for David. And he tried to kill David. And all these things happened in his life. Why? Because of all these battles that were raging in his mind. And ultimately, Saul came to his own demise. Anyone know what happened to Saul? Saul not only died in battle, but in reality, Saul took his own life. Saul, a man in the word of God. But there are others governed by their emotions, their reactions to what they were experiencing in life. How many know Elijah, the mighty prophet of God, the one who would say it would not rain, the one that say that rain is coming and it would happen just exactly as though he said what he said called the mighty prophet of God. But yet, when he was threatened by the queen who said, if, if my life will be gone by tomorrow if your life is not gone by today. And the moment this mighty prophet of God heard that threat upon his life, he fled in fear. So much so that the Bible says that he too said, what good is my life? Oh Lord, take away my life. For I am no better than my father. This was Elijah, the mighty prophet of God, who was overwhelmed by his situation, by the threat of something happening in his life. We've been there before. We, we, we've been there before because something has happened in your life and it feels as though it's a threat in your life and it's coming against you and your well-being. And because of that, you're overwhelmed by the emotion of what may occur. That was Elijah. We began to feel all this, all this emotion. He couldn't believe. He thought he'd come and he would, he would, re, he would in, what, what in his, his efforts would, would reform the nation. And it didn't happen the way he thought that it would. How many of us have ever been disappointed because something did not happen the way that we thought it should? Oh, yes. That's when your trust comes in. That's when God says, I will keep you in perfect peace. You keep your mind on me in spite of everything. You keep on trusting in me and let me prove myself to be God to you, says the Lord. There are others. Moses, whose anger often controlled his actions. Yes, that was Moses. Remember when Moses came, he came down from the mountain with the tablets of God and he saw the revelry of the people. And what did Moses do? 
But he got angry for what they were doing, and he cast those Ten Commandments at the people or just threw them down, and they broke because he was angry. And I know that even sometimes if I was to ask this question and I would have everyone close their eyes and I ask you this question, is there anyone here that is ever controlled by uncontrollable anger in your life? I wonder how many people would raise their hands. I didn't even ask you to raise, I didn't even ask you to close your eyes and I saw all these hands go up. That was him. Remember Job, remember Job. Oh, we hear the patience of Job. Oh, he was so patient. Oh, through his situation, he was so patient. But we very seldom hear that, no, no, no. Actually, he was angry with his condition. He said, I don't deserve this. He even cursed the day that he was born. The patience of Job. And then there was his wife. We often criticize his wife because his wife says to him, curse God and die. And oftentimes, we, we simply leave it at that, and, and, we, and we've even said, well, what kind of wife is she? Telling him, curse your, the, the Lord and God and die. But here's the side that we don't ever think about. Remember, it was her children that were killed. Don't tell me that a natural mother in her condition who lost all her children would not feel a sense of negative emotion. And that's what she experienced. Oh, oh, there was, there was, remember Naomi. Na Na Naomi, she blames God for all her problems, all her situations. And when they call her Naomi, she says, don't call me Naomi, Naomi, call me Mara. Because Mara means bitter. Naomi was saying, no, no, I'm bitter with God. I'm bitter with life. Call me Mara. And there were times in our lives where we we're bitter because of what we've gone through. Come on, let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever been bitter because of something that happened in your life? And we, would anyone raise their hand and say, just like Naomi, you would say, God, you did this to me. God, you allowed this to happen to me. God, I was serving you, and yet this happened. God, I am angry and mad at you. Is there anyone here that would say, I've been angry or mad? Look at the hands. You're not alone. Oh, there's more. There's more. Remember, remember Peter. Peter had a temper. He, he, listen, Peter, in, in his love and, and, and for, for Jesus, when they came to arrest Jesus, anyone know what, remember what Peter's anger caused him to do? He cut off Malchus's ear. Remember that? I wonder if I ask the question, how many of you have ever felt or desired to do that to someone else? How many of you would raise your hand? I see, I see, some, I see some people that told the truth. Paul, 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 last one I'm going to give you. Paul, remember Paul. Even the apostle Paul, the Bible says he burned with indignation because of all that he went through. Paul. So brothers and sisters, you're not alone. I'm not alone. We're not alone. But I've, but I've come to the realization, it's not a matter of, of what happens in our life and what emotion that we experience because of those situations. What's more important is how do we respond when it happens? What is it that we do? How is it that we can understand through all of these things? Because I've come to the realization once again that there are so many things that can impact us or having a sound mind or having life and having it more abundantly. And more often than not, it's in our emotions, in our situations that occur. Insecurity can cause negative emotions. Jealousy, negative emotions. Unforgiveness, anger, impure thoughts, the inability to conquer any particular area in your life can cause negative emotions in your life. Make you feel that you're not good enough, that you're not qualified. But I'm here to tell somebody today, let me just say this. In your own natural condition, in my own natural condition to these situations, we're not good enough. Because most of us will acknowledge that when we are put to the test, when we use our own natural responses, we fail. There are times when I have to remind you that in the middle of your weakness, God wants to show his power through you. That God himself is the one who can help you through these situations in your life. 
but yet we let all these things happen. Doubt. Anyone ever doubt the promises of God? You can be, you can, you can, you can, you can it's okay to be transparent. It's okay. Because it's, it's, it's in acknowledging those things that you can admit that there's something that needs to be done about those situations. Worry. Anyone, anyone here ever worry? Let me ask you this question. Is there anyone here today that is worrying even today? I see the hands. And more importantly, he sees the hands. How about fear? You're afraid of what might happen. Some of you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Some of you don't know what's going to happen next week. Some of you don't know what's going to happen when your, 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 your utilities are done. You don't know what's going to happen. And there, you're, you're today in a semblance of fear, not knowing what's going to occur. And these thoughts govern our minds. But this is what it leads to. Something that most often or not, they won't discuss. They don't want to talk about this because, because you shouldn't really discuss this in church because it gives a false sense of security it, when you come against this. And, and you know what? You know what all these things lead to? Let me just be forthright and honest with you. The world will call it anxiety. Anxious. To be anxious is to worry. To be concerned. Anxiety is a little bit different. Because all of these things, left uncontrolled, left unchecked, will lead to this place. And when it leads to this place, then oftentimes you go be, be beyond the threshold of you doing something on your own. Why? Because now you've crossed the line, and now the world tells you, this is what you need. This is what you must have. And once again, I'm not here to tell you they're wrong. I'm here to tell you that if Jesus is not the greatest source in your life, then you've not yet dealt with it in every way that you can. Listen to this as I look this up. Anxiety. It says anxiety is not always related to an underlying condition. It may be caused by stress that can result from work, school, personal relationship. Emotional trauma. Financial concerns. Stress caused by a chronic or serious medical condition, a major event or performance, side effect of certain medications, alcohol consumption, drugs such as cocaine, lack of oxygen. So that's, those are the common causes of this in our lives or in the lives of the people of God in a dying world. But today I want to offer you hope. For those of you who are going through something that is controlling your thoughts, I want to give you some definable means by which you can come against that situation in your life. Are you with me? As I stated to you before, the promises of God are often conditional. There are very few promises that he makes that he does not in some form or another let you know that there is something that you must do. But when you do this, when you respond to what God says, this is what you're to do. I'm here to tell you that the promises of God are yes and amen to those who believe. Come on now, do I have a witness this morning? That you know that you know that you know that when you stand on the promises of God. Let me take you real quickly for the next few minutes of what you can do. If your mind controls, your thoughts control you. If you're at a place in, in, in your life where you don't know what to do because your emotions are overwhelming you, I'm going to ask you to take this into perspective and ask yourself, have I done this? Am I doing this now? Because what I, one thing that I know is that this word is not only a book of deliverance, it's a book of salvation. And it is an answer to all of your problems. Number one, number one, ask yourself, have I done this? Am I doing this right now? In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you 
and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Have you done this? There's a universal call to all that we're here. will hear, Jesus has come to me. All you that labor and are heavy laden. All you that are overwhelmed by life. The problems that you go through. The situations that happen every day. No one's around. You're, whatever happens. Ha, ha, have you taken those burdens? They're, they're heavy on you. Jesus has come to me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. That's the first thing that we have to do. Respond to Jesus on this side of heaven. I'm not saying respond to a church. I'm not saying respond to a pastor. I'm not saying respond to a denomination. I'm not saying respond to a song. I'm saying respond to Jesus when he says, come to me. First thing you have to do. If you have not done that, then you're bypassing the very first and most important element to you overcoming your mental battles, whatever they may be. Number two, number two, found in the book of Matthew chapter six. It's going to go straight down to the, to, to, to the word, to the, the verse for the sake of time, the brevity of time. I'm going to say in Matthew 6, 33, it, it says this, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus, in context, is talking about worrying. And he goes on and gives these examples or these analogies of, don't you see what I do for these? How much more will I do it for you? How much more will the Father do it for you? But then he makes this conditional response once again. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek ye first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And, and not just the kingdom of God, but the righteousness that goes along with being in the kingdom of God. We cannot just claim the kingdom of God and not live our lives in a righteous manner and expect to get the response, and these things shall be added unto you. Come to me, says the Lord. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Let me ask you this question. Is Jesus first in your life? Once again, I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about the blessings of God. I'm talking about Jesus. Is Jesus the most important part of your life? Because I'm trying to give you answers to your dilemmas, your problems. And it's up to you to determine, have I done this? Number three, number three. It's found in Philippians chapter three. Now, now suffice it to say, there's so many others, but for the sake of this message, I just pulled out a few that I feel that can make a difference in your life. Philippians 3, 12. Not that I have already attained or already, already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which for which Jesus Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. He says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So many of us today are governed by what's already happened in our lives. Something that you cannot change, something that you cannot make, you cannot do anything about, but we're still holding on to those things. And in order for us to get beyond that place in our life, we must understand what the Word of God says, forgetting those things which are behind. Listen, if you can't change it, if you can't do anything about it, it's time to forget about those things and go beyond those things and move forward to the things which are ahead. Don't get stuck in your past. Don't get stuck in your failures of the past. Because if that is what you do, you will never fulfill what God, the reason why God has laid a hold of you. 
If you disqualify yourself by your past, you will never fulfill your destiny in him. So you have to let it go. And you have to press toward the goal. You gotta press. Come on now, pressing takes some effort. Pressing takes something on your end, on your side to make it happen. If you're not pressing in, then you're really not giving it the effort that it needs. You have to press. Number four, Philippians 4, 6, 9. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Here it is once again. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything. He, he, he says, but in, in everything, by prayer and supplication, you pursue the things of God. You pursue your communication. And with thanksgiving, did you see that what it says here? It's not saying just when the good things happen, you give thanks. It's saying in everything, in everything. Why? Because we don't know what God is doing in the middle of your everything. And maybe it's in the middle of your everything that God will take you to where he wants you to be. And if it wasn't for that everything in your life, you would never go or he would never capture your attention like he wants to. So he says, in all things, in everything, give thanks. Some of the greatest, most difficult times in my life, I'll tell you, I didn't feel I deserved it. But I gave thanks. Why? Because God used that in my life to continue to mold me and make me into who I would become. So in everything, give thanks. Don't worry. Here's another one. He says this. He says, if you do this, if you do this, then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Did you get that? No, no come on. I, I don't know. I, I have not heard anyone shouting about the promises of God, but I'm telling you something in this place, people of God, the word of God gives us reason why you and I should be able to express our gratitude and thanksgiving and shout unto God. Why? Because his promises are true. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. That situation in your life tells you there's no way you should be at peace. There's no way. Why? Because that situation is too big. You should be overwhelmed. You should be overcome. But the peace of God will surpass all understanding. Why? Because you trust in him. You trust in him. Look, if your hearts, your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions... Well, you might say, well, Pastor David, how, yeah, it sounds easy for you, but how, how do you do that? How, how do you do that when my life is in turmoil, when everything is going on? How, how is it that you're telling me that I can control my thoughts and honor God? Listen, what it could, let's keep on reading. Anyone here want to keep on reading the Word of God? Look at what it says. How do you do this? How, how do you do this? Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You and I have to get rid of those thoughts that do not fall into this category. Because he says, think on these things. That's what you do. Real quickly, and I'm almost done. I'm not going to get done completely, but I'm going to be close. I have so much more. But I'm hoping that, that through the presentation of this message, you and I can come to the realization that we can have a sound mind. But much of what, to get there, it's not a matter of osmosis. 
It's not just a matter because Jesus has a sound mind and that Jesus has peace, that we're going to have peace. He says, you may have. How is it that you may have? It's because how you respond to what happens will determine if you will. So notice, notice, notice. Here it is. What, what, what else do we have to do, Dave, Pastor Dave? What else? First Peter chapter 5. Listen what it says in verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to the elders. Yes, all of you be submissive one to another and be clothed with humility because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Did you hear that? He gives grace to the humble. This word, listen, listen, I want you to understand this word because there's so many variations of this meaning. But in this context, it means to be depressed. That be, means to be cast down, to be humble to a low degree. He says he, give, he gives grace to those who acknowledge that they cannot make it on their own, that situations, yes, are overwhelming, but when you trust in him and in his promises, he says, because you trust in me, I will show and display my grace unto you, says the Lord. He gives grace to the humble. Why? Why? The Bible says, it says, goes on to say, therefore humble, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him. You, you, you know, you, casting. You have your problem. You, you have all your issues. You have everything. No, no, you're, 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 you're casting it on him. This word, this word upon I, I, I saw the meaning of this word, and I thought it was so amazing because, because the definition of this word upon, it simply means, in its, in its true definition, to superimpose. Maybe we don't know what superimpose means, but it's imagine this is you and all your problems, and, this, and this, is, this is me and all my problems, and all, I'm all beat up, and we superimpose our cares upon him, and we cast all of our issues, all of our problems, everything upon him. You superimpose. Why? Because he cares for you. He cares for you. He careth for you. Somebody say that with me. Jesus careth for me. Come on now, somebody. Say it like you mean. Jesus careth for me. How many of you in this place believe that Jesus careth for you? Then it must control your thoughts. No matter what the situation is, no matter what occurs. No matter what happens, the last one I'm going to give you is this, and, and then I'm, I'm done. Once again, I, I have so much more, but, I, but I'm going to be done. And you laugh because you believe me, not because you don't. <laughs> Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you. Paul, I beseech you to, to call near. I invite, I invoke upon you. Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Think about that, people of God. Because, because he is saying, Paul is saying to the Romans, that, that by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Is that what you are? Is that what I am? Ask yourself right now, are you willing to say, Lord, here I am. I give it to you. I surrender to you. I take my life upon you. I will sacrifice my will. I will sacrifice my desires. I will sacrifice my aspirations for whatever it is that you want of me. That's where it starts. But then he goes on to say, holy, holy. I wonder how many of us are presenting ourselves as a holy sacrifice. Because remember, people of God, many of the promises of God are contingent upon your response to the promises of God. You play when Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. He's saying that if you do these things, then I or God the Father will do this to you, for you. So he says that to all of us. If you are willing to do these things, then this is what I will do for you, says the Lord. So the question is, are we? Are we? Are you coming before the throne of God holy in reverence 
Or is there something in your life that would disqualify that approach based upon the flesh, based upon your desire, based upon your irreverent attitude of not being holy before the Lord? You see, that's one of the things that's missing today in this common generational church is that we've, we've done away with the area of living in holiness. And yet we expect the promises of God. He says, do this. Do this. And I want you to see. I'm going to ask worship team to start coming back up because if you will, I'm almost done. He says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And what I want you to see, this is a, which is your reasonable service. Don't, don't, please don't get distracted because this is important. Reasonable service. This word service literally means menstruation of God. That is worship. Are you listening to me? That is worship. You see, in the word of God, people of God, it conveys to us the idea that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. It says this to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Here it is. Listen, listen. The, the heart of this message is the control of your mind, the control of your thoughts. But listen to what it says here. It says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Listen, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Did you hear that? The battle is exalts itself against the knowledge of God. What is it that you know about the God that you serve? Everything is going to come against the knowledge that you have about the God that you serve. And the Bible very clearly says that, that, that the weapons are of our warfare. Bring all of these things into captivity. Why? To bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You want to overcome? You want to overcome the situations? You want to get over your worry, your doubt, and your fear? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God. For the pulling down of strongholds. Align that with the area of worship. And God says to you and to me that if you put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, we are to put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Right. That's right. And oftentimes we're overwhelmed by the heaviness. Yes. And God says in his word, this is what you need to do. Seek me first. Put me first. Pursue on me with all your heart. Sacrifice your life unto me. Trust me. Obey me. And no matter what happens, I'm here to tell people, God, you can have the sound mind that God said, I come that you might have. But it's up to you. It's up to you. If you let anything else get into your mind and thoughts that should not be there, I guarantee you that it's going to come against the things that God says you need to do.